age. We have the Shia, who the differing factions are some 165 million followers worldwide. It's very large, although it's very fractious, there are some 25 subsets amongst them, but the largest are what are called the Ithna Ashariya, which are the Twelvers. The Twelvers, they are the largest, and they can be found in the Gulf, they can be found in Iraq, and they are most numerous in Iran, as well as building growing communities in the United Kingdom, as well as the United States. And then we also have at the end, this with the known as the Liberation Party. They're between 25 to 30,000 uh, foot soldier followers worldwide. They have different centers in most countries, be it the Gulf, particularly the nexus of where they come from in Jordan, in Amman. I've got access to documentation from them as far back as 1953 when their organization began. So they're very famous. There is a, uh, numerous files on the Hizb al-Tahrir organization, and they've also uh, been examined by a number of other uh, <coughs> social engineers and other figures. Now, we would then like to discuss each one of the organizations briefly and in what way they would be abandoning Muslim Orthodoxy. As each group is unique, each has its own special and exotic form of aberration that has taken it from the 1.5 billion Orthodox Muslims the world over. Let's take a closer look at each one. Now, I won't have time to look at each one because time is limited. So what I will do is I will just look at the main tenets of one in particular, which is the reason that I was asked to discuss things. We want to take a closer look at Hizbut Tahrir. We want to take a closer look at Hizbut Tahrir. Now, it is a large organization in terms of, in terms of its ability to organize followers, in terms of its ability to garner support, as well as its, its uh, overall stretch into many different countries and areas. They've got them in Egypt, my ancestral homeland. They've got them in many different places, as well as in the uh, recently liberated Central Asian Russian republics. They are also making incredible leaps and bounds there. Now, Hizb al-Tahrir is a worldwide organization that claims uh, to specifically be a political ideology rather than a theological movement. It has between 20,000, 20 to 30,000 followers worldwide based on the best estimates extant. I've taken that from the uh, encyclopedias of Funk and Wagnalls as well as others. It was founded in the year 1953 by a Jordanian man by the name of Taqi al-Din al-Nabahani. Since its inception, it has spread worldwide to embrace many different countries. Many can spot them on colleges and university campuses, famous for their style of argumentation and debate. But we should be concerned, should we be concerned, about some of the underlying tenets of this is, or if we want to call it so, a cult. Should we be concerned? We'll need to examine carefully this organization to know clearly and resolutely what their stance is with the Orthodox faith. We find that there are some three to five major concerns with them. I'll only document three today. The other two uh, would require a separate lecture, all its own. Uh, it would need a separate lecture uh, on its own. Now, these three areas I want to look at are concerns with Orthodox theology. How is the theology? Number two, non-teaching of systematic Orthodox theology. Number three, the demand of absolute obedience. I want to look at those and examine them uh, a little bit in depth, but not too much past the ability of the class because I know time is pressing. We have concerns with Orthodox theology. There are many in Hizb al-Tahrir that are themselves not fully aware of the theology that they teach or are being taught. This primarily has to do with the fact that they did not learn foundational theology before joining the organization. Thus, they are prime targets. I have seen in universities and other campuses where they have specifically been told to go to those who are not specifically argumentative, but to go for the jahan ones, the ignorant ones in particular. Now, one of the most egregious things that any person could believe with regard to the punishment of the grave. Punishment of the grave is something that is part of the theology of Muslim Orthodox. However, Hizb al-Tahrir denies this as part of his theology. The founder of Hizb al-Tahrir and Mr. Taqiyuddin al-Nabahani states the following. He says, quote, the ahad, ahadith, are those that require action. It has been narrated from Abu Huraira, who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu wa said, when any of you finishes the last of shahud, he should seek refuge with Allah from four things. From the punishment of the fire, number one. Number two, from the punishment of the grave. Number three, from the trials of life and death. And number four, from the tribulation of the Dajjal. And it has been narrated from Aisha that the Prophet sallallahu that he used to make supplication in the prayer. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave. I seek refuge in you from the trials of the false messiah. And I seek refuge in you from the trials of life and death. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from debt and sin. 
But these two ahadith are ahad narrations, and they contain the requirements of an action. An example, to carry out the supplication after finishing the tashahud. So it is recommended to make the supplication after finishing tashahud. And it's permissible to attest to what is contained in them, meaning to do tasdeeq. However, what is haram is to hold it with certainty, meaning to have it as part of one's creed, aqidah. As long as it has only been reported the ahad hadith, which is a dhanni, non mutawatir speculative proof. However, if it occurs in mutawatir, mass transmitted form, then it is obligatory to make it part of one's, one's creed. This is from the book at Dosia, or sometimes called the Dusia, page six, as well as the denial of ahad hadith being mentioned in al Shahsiyat al Islamiyya, pages 186 to 191 and 240 to 247. Now, there's something that needs to be sort of said about this first. The understanding of ahad and mutawatir hadith has to be sort of ironed out first. Mutawatir are hadith that have been transmitted so many times it's impossible for them to be a lie. Now there are two types of mutawatir. There is mutawatir lovely and mutawatir ma'anawi. Mutawatir lovely means the same phraseology has been transmitted over and over and over again. I'll give you an example. Whoever lies against me intentionally, let him take his place in the fire. That's from Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's mutawatir lovely. That is something that has been transmitted so many times, the exact same speech, every single time over and over again. Then you have what's called mutawatir ma'nawi. Mutawatir ma'nawi means that it has different speech in it, but it is mutawatir in that it has been referred to in different ahadith. I'll give you an example. The ahadith about the Mahdi, which are also in Sahih Muslim. Now they have been mentioned in many different channels in many different ways, but not in the same phraseology. But we know that the meaning of those hadith is mutawatir because the Sahaba have narrated them as a jama'ah consistently and constantly. You have a second form of hadith. Those are called ahad. A uh, had hadith that uh, they're usually called singly, singly narrated hadith. Those are hadith that are less than mutawatir. They don't meet the requirements of mutawatir. Now those a hadith, they could possibly be mutawatir ma'nawi, which is mutawatir in meaning, like the hadiths about the Mahdi. Those are singularly narrated, but they're mutawatir in their meaning because of so many different people have narrated them, even though the hadith is ahad. Um, there was never a problem in the Muslim orthodoxy in the beginning of taking hadith that are ahad into the theology or the creed. This distinction was never made. That we take the mutawatir, but we only do tasdiq certainty, and we don't have iman in the ahad hadith. We don't take them into our theology. That is something that was only done by the Mu'tazila. That is primarily Mu'tazila theology. How do we know that? Well, we need to ask a question. What do the Orthodox theologians say about these ahad hadith? Because they say, he had said, Taqid din al-Nabahani, it's allowed to do tasdeeq of the hadith, of the punishment of the grave, but you can't have iman in it. So you can testify to their truthfulness, but you can't believe in it. If you take it in your creed, it's haram. But what do, what do our theologians say? The Orthodox theologians, the guys that we are trying to follow, they, let's take Imam al-Tahawi rahimahullah, who died in 239 AH. He says, quote, we believe in the punishment of the grave for those who deserve it. Listen, notice this, nu'minu, we believe. Didn't say tasdiq, we believe. It's part of the theology. We believe in the punishment of the grave for those who deserve it, and in the questioning in the grave by munkir and nakir about one's Lord. Munkar and nakir about one's Lord, religion, and prophet as has come down in the narrations from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions Radhuallahu Alaihi Majma'een May Allah be pleased with them all Close quote This is taken from Al-Aqidat Al-Tahawiyah page 14 The credo point number I, I have to find that But it is uh, page 14 Now we have Imam Abu Bakr Al-Ajri Now he's from the third generation He's from the third generation So he was in the time of Imam Ahmed So his creed is very important because his creed will indicate how the orthodox generation saw the issue of taking the punishment of the grave into theology. He says we believe in it. Imam Abu Bakr al-Ajri, rahimahullah, who's also in 
that tail end of the third generation. He died in 971 AD, Rahim He states in his work, Kitabu Sharia, under the chapter, it's actually called Al Iman Wa Tasdiq Bi Adab Al Qabr. The Iman, belief, and certainty, Tasdiq, in the punishment of the grave. And he says, quote, there is nothing more evil than the one who denies these ahadith. Someone who denies these reports has gone far astray and has indeed lost all righteousness and goodness. Close quote. This is taken from Kitab al-Shari'a, page 298. It's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. Imam Muwafiq al-Din, rahimahullah, the famous jurist, the Hanbali theologian par excellence. He's, he doesn't need any introduction. He died in 1223 AD, rahimahullah. He stated, when he was talking about what it is compulsory to have Iman in, he said, quote, and the tribulation of the grave is true, and the questioning of Munkir and Nakir is true. Close quote. Taken from Numa'at al page 16. So he said, you have to have Iman in it. All right? You have to believe in it resolutely and without doubt. Resolutely and without doubt. Now we come to another figure. Shaykh al Islam Yahya al Nawi, rahimahullah. He's very important. He died in 1277 AD. He said, quote, And one of the things that these ahadith establish is that the punishments of the grave and its torment is an established thing. And this is the way of the people of truth, which is in contradiction to that of the Mu'atazila. Close quote. This is taken from Sahih al-Muslim, Bishak al nawawi volume 5, pages 85 to 86. So he's saying that, again, it's part of the theology. But he continues on further and, and, and says something even more explicit. He says, quote, Know that Muslim orthodoxy established the punishment of the grave due to the former overwhelming amount of evidences for it in the book and the sunnah. Allah has said, the fire. They are exposed to it in the morning and the evening. Surah Ghafir, the 40th surah, ayah 46. And there have been an overwhelming amount of obvious evidences from the sahih ahadith from the Prophet wasallam, from narrations from a group of the sahaba in many places. And whatever is not hindered by acceptance by the intellect, as well as what is related in the revealed law, it is compulsory to accept it, that's the testiyah he's talking about, and to have it as one's creed and theology. Close quote. This is taken from Sahih al-Muslim, Ishaq al volume 17, pages 200 to 201, and also pages 200 to 207. So that's very important. Belief in it, testiyah, and part of one's theology. He says you must have that. Now there have been some that have quoted, a, they've tried to quote a statement from him, Sahih al-Muslim bi Sharh al-Nawawi, uh, it's volume 1, page 20, where they've said that he appears to be denying Ahad Hadith and Ahad Hadith and theology. That's not true. Take that and cross-reference it with this. It's not true at all. And the quotes that they give about Imam Shafi'i as well as Imam al-Suyuti, those are also false quotes and taken out of context. Now we come to Imam Sa'ad al-Din al-Taftizani, rahimahullah, the great Hanafi jurist, who lived from 1322 to 1390 AD. He states, commenting on this issue in his commentary, he says, quote, Some of the Mu'atezila and the Shia deny the punishment of the grave because a dead man is solid and devoid of life and comprehension. So punishing him is impossible. The answer to this is that, <clears throat> the answer to this is that it is possible for Allah to create in all or in some of the parts a kind of life such as will be able to comprehend the pain of punishment or the enjoyment of bliss. This does not require that the soul be returned to the body, nor that it move or be troubled or show any mark of punishment, or even a drowned man in water, or the one devoured in the bellies of beasts, or the one crucified in the air. In this is punished, although we do not see it. Whoever ponders the wonders of Allah in the kingdoms of this world and the heaven, and the marvels of the power and might, will not consider such things improbable, let alone impossible. Close quote. This is taken from Sheikh al taqid al-Nasafiyya, pages 160 to 161. He was a major, major Hanafi jurist. Now, let's take another point. Because the organization could say, because we're making the difference between the organization and the people, the organization could say, listen, these hadiths are ahad, we don't care what you say, we're still not going to use them. Okay, let's say we leave the hadith for a second. There are numerous passages in the Qur'an that refer to punishment in the grave. And as we know, the Qur'an is mass transmitted by consensus from the Sahaba. There's nothing ahad in there. Qur'an is mass transmitted. So, if we were to concede the point on not accepting the punishment to the grave in a hadith, there would still be numerous ayat in the Qur'an where Allah mentions it. And as we know, the first three generations consider the Qur'an to be mass transmitted by consensus. 
Thus, these passages would be very important. Those interested in the punishment of the grave could look at the following nine passages.